the Himalayas, land of the mightiest mountains on Earth. Here, soaring above India's border with Tibet, lies a range so remote that even its highest peak is neither named nor mapped. Few have ever set eyes on these faraway summits. Guarded by icy walls and towering crests of snow, the distant peaks of Kinnor have remained unclimbed as Everest and other Himalayan giants have fallen before the mountaineers. But using modern lightweight techniques, in 1994, a team attempted to penetrate this remote range and take up the challenge of these huge faces. No one had been to the highest summit, and it was fitting that it should be Britain's greatest mountaineer, Chris Bonington, who would go as joint leader of the Indian-British Kinnor expedition, with Harish Kapadia, India's most experienced mountain explorer. A cloth merchant from Bombay, Harish is the driving force in Indian mountaineering. Sheffield lecturer Paul Nunn is president of the British Mountaineering Council with more than 30 years of climbing behind him. Cumbria-based Jim Fotheringham is a dentist and also from Cumbria, Jim Lowther, a land manager. Graham Little was originally from Yorkshire but now works for the Ordnance Survey in Scotland. And making up the team, Jim Curran from Sheffield, who's filmed throughout the world's greatest mountains. Joining forces with five Indian climbers Jim and his friends set out to explore the unknown range and attempt its highest peak. The unknown mountain is actually 0.6553. It dominates the Kinnor Range in northern India, almost on the border of Tibet. Unmapped and unexplored, it was out of bounds to climbers until last year, when the Indian-British expedition got permission. The expedition starts in Bombay, where climbing cameraman Jim Curran takes up the story. The gateway of India, not the usual place to start a climbing expedition, but it's the home of Harish and the Indian climbers. It's also a chance to buy last supplies and adjust to the heat and humidity. The heat is already intense as dawn rises over Bombay Racecourse. This is the place where hundreds of Bombay citizens exercise, and it's where Chris and Harish can stretch their legs before we start the long train journey north to the Himalaya. We travelled on the overnight express north to Delhi and next day up to the first foothills of the Himalaya. There we boarded the Viceroy's train, a rack railway leading up to Simla, the old summer capital in the days of the Raj. As we gained height, we could almost sense the presence of the Memsabs fussing over their baggage and children as the whole British administration decamped to the cool of the hills. At last, we'd left the plains, baking in the hottest summer for years, and looked forward to the clean, dry air of the mountains. Now, we were in a Buddhist culture. Chris, Harish and Paul were all fascinated by this ancient religion, and the monks in the local monastery organised a puja, or blessing, to wish us luck on our adventure. My reaction to the temples is to almost to see layer upon layer of different beliefs. And this is one of the main, main areas where, where Buddhism, in a sense, originates. It was the main, one of the main communication routes between Tibet and India, along which all these religious things were, were translated. The puja itself, I find very, very reassuring. It's, I suppose, a little bit of superstition, but it does give one the moment to actually reflect about the expedition. And I remember just praying that we'd all got on well together and that we'd come back alive. All travellers to the Himalaya will eventually have to cope with river crossings, sometimes wading, sometimes on antique suspension bridges woven from birch twigs. By comparison, this one is high tech, but still far from reassuring. While we waited our turn to carry the gear across, Harish chatted to the local Kinuris. In this part of the Himalaya, the women play a full role in society. Their warmth and assurance 
making a welcome change from areas where they're still seen as inferior beings. They were certainly a lot more confident than we were as they and their children braved the surging torrent. Sheffield mountaineer Paul Nunn has been on 17 Himalayan expeditions but still finds river crossings thought-provoking. Crossing the rivers uh, is often the most dangerous part of, of the walk in on the Himalayan trip. The, we have to go across in this wooden box, you know, it, when it collapses, then they replace it. Yeah, the water is absolutely freezing. Uh, if you fall into this river, I mean, you, you won't last very long, you won't remember very much about it. We walked up the banks of the Turang River through a valley of quite stunning charm and beauty. We had given ourselves about a month to climb the peak and return. We loaded our train of donkeys on a walk that would take about three days to the last village. On these long treks, it's easy to slip into a rhythm of walking, camping, sleeping and eating. As the evening approaches, we set up camp. The unknown mountain was still hidden from view, but in this deep valley, there were other wonders to behold, as Chris Bonington explains. It was really incredible coming round a corner of the valley and suddenly these huge granite walls, they must have been at least 3,000 foot high. I mean, they'd make an absolutely superb climbing holiday in their own right. They're as fine, say, as some places which are absolutely world famous. But time was pressing, and the crags would have to wait for another visit. The question we were all asking was, where on earth was our mountain? We weren't alone. On the third day, we were gaining height and the view was opening up. As we came round a bend in the path, we finally saw the range of mountains we had come to climb. It was an exciting moment as months of planning finally came into focus. But actually getting to the foot of our mountain, point 6553, was easier said than done. Have you got the map, Harish? Chris and Harish found the first view perplexing and it took some time to sort out exactly what we were looking at. The range seemed far more complex than we had imagined, and the map was increasingly irrelevant. But it's a complicated peak, isn't it? But Chris, I think we are looking at the wrong side. I mean, you know, we have to go in left of this terrain, turn this valley, and come behind. Oh, I agree with that. So I think this rocky peak may not be 6553. The snowy peak behind could be 6553. Seriously? You don't think that one's 6553? I have my doubt. This is one of the outliers towards us. Oh, but I disagree with you. Uh -huh. I'm, sh I'm sure that is 6553. And I think that so very... Where is the plateau then? The plateau is over to the right. We, we are not see. going here, we are going here. For Charang, Charang we are going to the left. This well, is look, Bangla that's Charang. There is that there. is Charang, then we go left and, and turn right. Sharp from no, there. sharp, you can see where we turn right. I'm sure of it. Look, that valley up there is the valley we go up. And our base camp, I'll bet you 100 rupees, OK? <laughs> is uh, <laughs> that big, <laughs> isn't it? OK, 1,000 rupees. No, no, 100 is <laughs> And look, we get the base camp. Is, we go yeah. up that valley there. The base camp is, is on where it flattens out in the basin. We go um, in this valley? Yes, in that what? valley. I'm absolutely convinced we go up into that valley, and I think at the end of those ice cliffs will be a, an easy way up. Yeah, I there you are correct. I mean, I mean, then you see, I mean, we go three kilometers from the river, I mean, village, till that tin hut. Yes. And from that turn right inside. Yes, that's right. And this is Mangala Khad way. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I was wrong at that. Yeah. yeah. So this is Mangala Khad, this is Racho mm. Khad, and this one is then there, which is the pass which is leading to Charanghati Park. Oh, way. that one there? Yeah. Ah, oh, okay. see. Yes, that, that makes sense. Was, uh, while Harish and Chris tried to sort out where we were, we approached the last village of Charang.
it's hard to describe the real elation of exploration, knowing that soon you're going to be doing something all too rare today, walking through unknown valleys where there's no established trails, guidebooks, rest houses or campsites. From now on, we would be using our own collective judgment in finding a way to the foot of our mountain. When we reached the last tiny village, we had our first setback. We were forbidden by the Indian-Tibetan border police from going up the easiest approach to the mountain. It was too near the politically sensitive Tibetan border. But local information suggested that the alternative route might be unjustifiably dangerous. Somehow, we had to find a third way to our unknown mountain. Didn't that old nun as well tell us that there was a pass. Yeah, that, she, now, where, where would that pass be on uh, this map? Slightly here. I mean, this is the Maspa divide. Yes. So maybe the pass is here somewhere. Um, just where this rock wall ends. Little out of the map, but you can see on the other way. Uh, so and from here, maybe you can come up. But then we'll be far away and we'll be approaching this peak. But, that, but that'd be all right, you see, because if we go right up here, even, we can then, all this, according to the map, it's a long way, I know, but it's all fairly easy angled, and I think it'd be a long, I mean, it's much better if we could go this way. But if the worst came to the worst, I think we could climb it by this way. So there were two feasible routes, but we had to recce each one carefully. The choice of route was actually made easy for us. The east ridge seemed safe, but the west face was threatened by an imposing ice cliff that sent huge avalanches across our route. We moved our supplies and equipment to Rakko Dogri, a superb point at over 4,000 metres. Once there, we could pitch our base camp and start the demanding process of acclimatisation. High altitude cricket was a bit one-sided, as our porters found no problem running around in the thin air. Even Jim Lowther, who plays regularly in Cumbria, found bowling at this height difficult. It didn't seem very different to recent England performances at sea level, and our fielding left a lot to be desired. Next. Slowly we moved higher and established an advanced base camp at around 5,000 metres. This would be our jumping off point to the mountain proper, but as we started to ferry loads, the weather, which had been good since we set off, changed. We knew that the monsoon arrives in late June, but we were worried that this might be an early warning. Jim Lowther. Well, we got up this morning and there's about three or four inches of snow on the ground, so everybody's gone, apart from Graham and I. Um, we might be doing another load up to Camp 1 today, if we've got the energy. Um, certainly the mountain's going to be out of condition for the next two or three days, with all this accumulation of snow on it. Uh, so it's a pity, really, but um, it's a patience game. Jim and Graham could still ferry loads, but we needed much more settled weather to tackle the steep climbing to come. After a couple of days of load carrying, we got most of our gear to advance base. Then the weather took a turn for the worst. It's snowing gently and we're waiting for a couple of porters, about four loads altogether, to come up. And above us, tantalisingly close, we can see what hopefully is our next campsite. And Harris has just said the weather is playing hide and seek with us, although I just say it was pretty bloody awful myself. The bad weather set alarm bells ringing. Could this be the beginning of the monsoon? We knew that when it cleared, we would have to move fast if we were to have any chance of climbing our mountain. From advance base to Camp 1 was a long and grueling walk. 
We had to carry big loads, but it was also at 17,000 feet, and the combination of thin air and hot sun made for a tiring day. We hoped the weather would hold out for the final week or so it would take us to climb the mountain. Camp one was at the foot of a long ice wall that proved to be the hardest section of the climb. To attain the summit of point 6553 is not straightforward. Before making a serious attempt at the ridge that leads to the top, we would have to reach the col. This involves tackling the ice wall, then a difficult and rather frightening traverse to the easy slopes to the col. Our first task is to equip the route with fixed ropes so we could eventually climb it relatively safely and also have a retreat in case of bad weather. It took three days to open the route, working in pairs. First Graham Little and Jim Lowther, then Paul Nunn and Diviesh Mooney made an attempt at the col at the foot of the long east ridge. I followed in support. Well, this is a very breathless cameraman talking to you, who's at this moment on the next belay station, about halfway up the fixed ropes, and trying to get out of it before the sun starts making life uncomfortable, to say the least, as the snow starts softening and falling rocks start tumbling from above. 200 feet away from me, Paul Nunn is ploughing out a rather lonely furrow towards the cull. He's still quite a long way from it, and from here it's very foreshortened. You can just see Paul more or less in the middle of the frame now. There's a little black dot above a diagonal sloping island. And he's aiming for the rocks diagonally above him to the right. The face was more difficult than it looked, as Graham Little explains. The, the slope itself wasn't desperately steep, but um, in fact it actually turned out to be quite a, a serious undertaking because the, the hard underlying ice was overlaid with a, a thick and fairly unstable mantle of snow, which um, meant that you couldn't really get very secure anchors and uh, there was always the danger of the whole damn lot slipping off. On the third day, Chris Bonington and Jim Fotheringham made the breakthrough to the coal. They returned tired but excited. Brilliant. If you want to make snow holes, my friend, <laughs> there are Patrick. all kinds of interesting opportunities. Yeah. What would you like then? It's, oh, yeah, uh, it's wonderful. hard work. No, 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 the, the route. The route. I think the route looks straightforward. I mean, I think one might have to be careful about wind slam, but one can just go, I and mean, I think you'd be, you, you know. Just die if it's on consolidated snow. But you could climb together. You know, you wouldn't be. I don't think you'd have to pitch it. You just climb well, for as far as you can see. Meters of rope. Well, up to the top of the first um, first ramp. Up to the top of that first ramp. Yeah. And I think you could have a a camp somewhere there, and you've got a reasonable run next day for the summit. On the following day, Graham and Jim, the Indians, Muslim Diviesh and Pasang, Paul and I set off to reach the cull and start our push for the summit. It was a hard day, but very satisfying as we gained height up the ice wall. We got up really early uh, for the day to get to the coal, because the slope to the coal is dangerous uh, after about 10 or 11 o'clock, but it freezes in the night, and Jim was off at 4.30. I packed the tent up and followed with a really heavy rucksack. It, it, I really wondered where I was going to be able to carry it all the way. But when I'd walked up to the, the crevasse at the bottom of the slope and clipped the fixed ropes, it began to feel a bit easier and we climbed up the face, um, catching Jim around about the traverse across the col. And at least traversing this great weight, you know, didn't feel quite such a burden. There were even bits that were downhill, you know, gravity on your side. And then we crossed onto the hanging glacier. It got a bit easier angle, and we were able to go up and camp on the col. <laughs> uh. Ah, well, not so bad now. On a perfect, clear, settled summer evening at about 19,000 feet with the prospect of a very hard day in store tomorrow. But with a bit of luck at the end of tomorrow, we should be able to see uh, where our summit is. At the moment, the expedition's strung out a bit. Graham Little and Jim Lowther are sleeping in uh, Camp 2. Uh, Paul and me are 
brewing up and getting ready for tomorrow. And down at Camp One, Jim Fotheringham and Chris Bonington, who did so much work yesterday in opening the route out to here, they're having a day off and coming up tomorrow, possibly coming through skipping Camp Two and catching us up. Whether they'll be able to do that or not is another matter. We shall see. The next day, we climbed on from the coal. The climb wasn't technically difficult, but never-ending, as the world slowly started to fall away and the air became thinner. As we approached 6,000 metres, I was going slower and slower. Chris and Jim caught us up, and we started looking for a ledge to pitch our tents, but we were to be disappointed. After an exhausting climb, we had to dig our own tent platforms. I wondered if I would recover as I started digging. Well, this section of the ridge proved, I think, a bit tougher than most of us thought it would be. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, we thought originally it might be about seven or eight rope lengths, and it turned out to be about 12. Exactly 12, I think, it? Exactly 12 <laughs> to this spacious ledge that we're all on here. Exactly, yeah. Which uh, <laughs> we're now trying to make habitable for the night. We're having to dig platforms out of this knife edge to try to um, make ourselves comfortable. It should actually be all right, but it's a lot of work. And uh, not everybody's idea of uh, you know, a holiday, really. It's about quarter to six. Today is our summit push. We've woken to the most staggering dawn, as you can see the most fabulous panorama around us. I'm just about to, to set off as the first rays of sun are catching some little subsidiary peak opposite. After only one rope length, I had to admit that I was shattered from the previous day and was in danger of holding the others back. Sadly, I gave the camera to Jim Lowther, then watched and waited as the others made their summit bid. It was very, very nerve-wracking. There was about... 12 inches of unconsolidated snow lying on hard ice, and the whole lot could have avalanched at any moment, and so you could never really relax on it. And there wasn't a single ledge either on that entire ridge. There was nowhere where you could actually pitch a tent or even really rest comfortably. And then suddenly we came to the top, and it was a matter of just stepping over the top, and there there was this incredible little summit. It was about the size of a volleyball pitch, I suppose. It's not often that eight people reach the top of a difficult unclimbed mountain, and it was doubly pleasing that Diviesh, Muslim and Pasang were to make it a truly joint first ascent. The Indian-British Kanur expedition had proved to be a total success. For Chris, with a wealth of Himalayan summits under his belt, this one, just before his 60th birthday, was rather special. It's one of the finest views I think I've ever had in all the mountains I've climbed. I mean, just looking to the east and you're looking across to the Garwal Himalaya and then swing across to the Gangotria and then on further south where there are the great thunderheads of cloud building up from the monsoon that was already beginning to engulf us and then swinging round now further to the west there was Kulu almost hidden in cloud, and then round again, the mountains of Spiti merging with the mountains of Tibet that just seemed to stretch forever into the distance. And I think the other really good thing about it was the way we'd actually climbed that mountain, all of us together. There were eight of us on that summit push, and it really was a joint Indian-British expedition. <laughs> 